Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Devin Buchanan looked out across the Starbucks and saw an old friend, a fellow named Michael Sullivan. Devin had been out of town for some time. Michael was sitting alone at a table nursing a coffee. Thinking about him and what he'd heard, Devin thought he'd drift over and see what was up. They'd been good friends once. Maybe, he figured, he could offer some insight. Devin paid for his coffee, picked up his brew, and walked over. As he crossed, he took in the appearance of his old friend. He certainly looked different from what he remembered. The skinny, almost frail boy had filled out. He wasn't fat, just well-built. It looked like he spent time in the gym. He was wearing what was clearly not a Walmart tie. His slacks and white shirt shouted not rich but moderately upscale. The sport coat hanging on the back of his chair looked good, not new, but well-maintained. He saw Michael was fiddling with what he recognized as one of the newer almost but not quite state-of-the-art portable computers. Devin wondered if it was true. Had Michael started to come into his own? As he got to Michael's table, it had been Mike when they were in school. He saw him look up. Michael exclaimed, Devin, Jesus, I haven't seen you in like it seems forever. Where have you been? Devin kept his coat on. He sat down, oh here and there. How have you been? Michael said, oh pretty good I guess. The usual school marriage a kid. Devin took a sip of beer. I heard. They say you married the Campanaris girl. Celine was her name. Right. Yeah, that's right. Celine Campanaris. Say did you ever get married? Devin took another sip. No I've been around though. He shifted in his seat. Heard it hasn't been all sunshine and light for you. Had some ups and downs? What happened? Oh you know. Boy meets girl. They fall in love. Get married. Have a kid. Another guy shows up. Things get complicated. Devin didn't smile. He took another slug of his java. What are you drinking there? Looks like a latte. Looks cold. Want another? Sure, Michael replied. As long as you're buying. Devin smiled. I'll buy. But if I do, I'd like you to fill me in. Michael eyed his old friend. Devin had always been one of the good guys. He'd been gone for some time. He'd probably leave again. Maybe for good. What the hell? Mike said, it's not real pretty. I mean not all hearts and flowers, but some things haven't been too bad. Devin waved at the waitress and pointed toward their coffees. Go ahead Mike. I'd like to hear it. And so, Michael began. Devin, I did marry the Campanaris girl. I'd always liked her, and when my brother moved out to join the Navy, I took my shot. That's right, said Devin. Celine and your brother? David wasn't it. They were an item back in the day. Yeah, they were. First love and all, you know. She and my brother dated off and on in high school. David's two years older than me and three years older than Celine. She was crazy about him. It tore her up when he took off. So, you stepped in? Not right away. Oh, I'd always had a thing for her, but she was David's girl. I guess you'd say I had a crush on her, but to her I was the kid brother. Devin commented. But you did marry her? Celine was lonely. She kept coming by the house. You know she'd stop in and see my mom, and dad to find out if they'd heard anything, but David never wrote or called. He was off seeing the world, or at least that's what we all thought. And let's not forget Devin. I married her, but she married me too. What David wasn't seeing the world? Couldn't say. Still not sure. I only know he was gone. We never heard from him, but Celine kept coming around. She was in a panic. I was a senior. She was a junior. She had her junior prom, and I had my senior prom. Now you know I never had a lot of luck with girls, not like David. Yeah, I remember your brother. Doesn't everybody? He told me once dating girls and getting in their pants was like looking for a job. You just kept asking till someone said yes. Celine said yes to your brother. No, not exactly. Celine said yes she loved him. She said yes she'd marry him. I'm convinced she would have quit school and gone with him if he'd asked her, but Celine was a good Catholic girl. You're Catholic. Know what that means. Oh yeah responded Devin. No premarital sex? Yeah, to the say least. She was insane. I mean she was crazy about him, but I was pretty sure Celine held my brother to it. I suppose he got tired of waiting. I know he liked her, even gave her his class ring, but he was cutting out on her too. He was 18, and he'd found himself a bored housewife. Sometimes I think that's why he skipped out. You mean the husband found something out? Maybe. I don't know. All I know is David split, and left poor Celine with a broken heart. Her parents were frantic. They thought she was suicidal. Look, I admitted I loved her. I was crazy about her, but she'd been my brother's girl. So you helped her out. I hadn't planned on it, but I guess that's how it worked. Off and on anyway. Devin took a sip of coffee. I see. I didn't understand things back then. 
I didn't understand her or me. Wished I had, then again. I don't know. It's tough you know? Me being a worrier and all, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking how she needed someone. A man who'd hold things together for her. So what happened? I mean what really happened? Michael sat back in his chair. Get me another coffee and one of those scones, and I'll tell you the whole story. Devin waved at the waitress, went over, got the stuff and came back. Michael began. Well David took off, joined the Navy, or so he said, and that was the last anybody saw or heard from him for years. Celine was devastated. She was crazy about my brother. Hell most girls were, but Celine was different. She was sort of delicate. An exemplary student she shied away from sports or the sports kids. Sure she played a little volleyball and stuff, but Celine spent more time in the library and in church than anything. Other kids wore provocative clothes. Tight jeans, short skirts, the come-see-me blouses. Not Celine. She was always prim and proper. Well, right after David disappeared, she started coming around to see my mom and dad. She'd hang around and talk. Pretty soon she and I were talking. I was a nerd like her. We had a lot in common. I thought so anyway. It was funny how she'd act. Whenever she saw me, her face would light up. She'd get real excited, and she'd giggle and run around like she was a squirrel. I might have been mistaken, but it was like whenever I saw her out someplace on her own, she'd be wearing what I'd call frumpy stuff like two large sweatshirts and sloppy-looking sweatpants, but whenever she came over, or whenever she knew she'd be seeing me she'd have on something real pretty. By pretty I don't mean necessarily sexy. I mean cute and perky. She'd have on a cute miniskirt and some kind of soft-looking button-up blouse. The blouses were all casual, but they were kind of what I'd call innocently alluring. I mean they looked, they like made her tits, well, you know. Celine had the longest, blackest, thickest, sleekest, shiniest, waviest hair I'd ever seen. I'd see her out and it'd be up in some functional toppy thing. But around me it was either down and combed out or in some long braid that showed off her long neck and pretty ears. All men are egoists, but I really think she dressed to impress me. I know I liked being around her. She could be so funny and cheerful. That cheeriness was almost all the time. The only times I ever saw her get morose or sad looking was when someone mentioned my brother. Then she'd get quiet, her eyes would get extra large, and she'd act like someone just ran over her dog. I know I really liked her. I wished I'd have met her first. Anyone could see she was carrying a torch for David, and it tore me up. Oh, and I loved the way she smelled. She had these odors. I know I'm not good at this. She wore some kind of perfume, Chanel or something, and her hair was always washed and it smelled so. I can't say, like fresh, and then her breath. I think she had one of those squirt things that people use to spray their mouths. I know she did because I saw her turn around and squirt her mouth. I know when we started dating and I kissed her she always tasted good. She had the softest, moistest lips. Man, she was sweeter than a sugar cookie. I can't help the way I am. I'm just a little obsessive compulsive. I thought about her night and day. I dreamed about her. I did everything I could to help her. I wanted her to be happy. I wanted her to forget my brother and fall in love with me. It was winter time. I was in my senior year. I'd always liked Celine. Hell, I admit it. I'd been daydreaming about her from day one. I was crazy about her, but I was the little brother. Older than her, but still definitely second string if I was on the team at all. Like I said it was winter time. Celine had plenty of opportunities to date, but she kept hanging around my house. What the hell? I asked her out. She agreed. That's how it began. I was madly in love. She saw me as her window into my family, and maybe a friend like a playmate. We dated all spring. Nothing happened. Maybe some light petting, a few furtive gropes over the blouse a casual rub on the outside of her panties, but nothing serious. We went to her junior prom, and then my senior. To the casual observer, we looked like we were deeply in love, but a closer look might have revealed a slightly different picture. For me, it was Celine, 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 but for her, it was more down boy. Watch it, and keep your distance. I wasn't discouraged because that's the way she'd been with David. Celine was a good girl. I graduated and got accepted at the local four-year commuters college. It was, and is an excellent school. I had always been good at math so I went right after a double major, one in business and a second in technology. For sure the math wasn't some kind of automatic springboard to success, but I learned math required more than just analytical thought. Any subject required that. No math required a steady diligence, a day-to-day -day persistence not as important in the liberal arts. I was smart. I was good. And I was determined. I also was still head over heels in love, and I still lived at home. Celine kept coming around, but by the time I'd started my freshman year in college, I was convinced she was coming around more for me than for news about my brother. Celine graduated right on time, and I took her to her prom. 
By then nobody could have missed the connection. Big Brother looked like old history. My freshman year had been the result of three years of accumulated savings. But during the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, I had to work extra hard to have enough money for the fall. I just didn't have the time to date and run around with the kids. Celine wanted to date around. This was her time. She was a damned fine-looking girl. Two-piece bathing suits were made for her. I have to admit it. Things were as much my fault as hers, but she just wanted to run and I had to work. I found one of the things I was good at was tutoring. I picked up some tutoring gigs. Girls mostly. I mean it was strictly business for me, but Celine might not have seen it the same way. She told me she wanted to date other boys. A lot of guys are like my brother. They're in the hunt all the time. I've never been like that. I thought with Celine I'd found the girl of my dreams. The girl I would spend the rest of my life with. It's like this. Some dogs will go with anyone who has food. Others would rather starve than leave their master. I was a one-woman dog. It was Celine or nobody. So about the time I was tutoring she broke things off and started to date around. Shit. Pretty soon when I wasn't working I was home moping around. If I did get out, which wasn't very often, I'd invariably see her. I think she knew. Hell I knew she knew my habits. Wherever I was she seemed to show up. Talk about gut-wrenching. She'd be out with last year's football star or the current college big shot. He'd be kissing and hugging and squeezing all over her. I couldn't handle it. I'd end up walking out, just leaving. My friends told me whenever that happened she usually cooled toward the guy she was with and went home early herself. That's kind of what kept me going. I mean kept me on the line. I believe she loved me. She was just being shitty. Well to make a long story short I guess I sort of gave up. I figured if she didn't know why I was working, and who I was working for then she could forget it. Oh I was working for myself, but I also felt like the better I did, and that meant college, then the better it was for her. I was serious about the little tart. I started looking around. If she could date I could date. To my surprise there were lots of girls who were interested in me. It sure didn't take long and I had a new girlfriend. Her name was Marge Vogel. She was pretty, she was smart, and she was a little bit serious about me. In fact she told she'd been interested in me since we were both in high school. I did think that was kind of strange since we'd attended different schools, but she explained that she'd met a friend who knew me and she'd been eyeing me ever since. I was just 20 and still cherry. Marge wasn't, and she showed me what life was all about. We were in my car one night and she and I were in a clinch. She reached down, pulled open my fly, and fumbled around in my underpants till she got my Johnny out. She gave me the best BJ ever. We can't stay here. I asked. Where do you want to go? Marge said her sister was married and they had a house. We could go there. And that's where we went. Her sister had a pretty nice place. Three bedrooms and a club cellar. We went to the cellar where Marge pulled out a daybed and that was that. Marge and I stayed together the rest of the summer. She didn't pressure me about work. We hooked up whenever I was off. Often I ended up sleeping with her right at her sister's. I liked Marge. I thought she was a lot of fun. But I knew she wasn't really the one for me. Not for the long term. When the summer ended Marge told me she was off back to Ohio State. I felt bad. I told her I'd miss her. She said she'd miss me too, and with that she was gone. Marge did a lot for me. In the ways of women and sex she'd become my teacher, but school was back in and I had to get on with my life. I thought of Marge a little, but it was Celine who I really missed. Celine had graduated, but never went on to college. She got a job selling tools at Lowe's. I knew that was where she worked because she still stopped by my parents' house once in a while. When she did we didn't talk, and from what I heard from my mom she never asked about David either. Mom told me Celine kept asking discreet question about what I was doing and if I was seeing anyone. My mom also told me Celine told her she was seeing some guy who worked in the electronics department at Sears and that he was a real catch. That's when some funny stuff started happening. I was in college, it was my sophomore year, the grades were good and I had a part-time job, but my mom decided she wanted someone to repaint the house. My dad couldn't do it because of his back so the honor fell to me. Mom said I could do it part-time while I wasn't studying or in classes. To keep me from working she started giving me money from her paycheck. I quit my part-time job. I was supposed to paint the house. Painting the house meant buying paint and supplies. There was a local hardware, but mom never liked the guy who owned it. Mom said even though his prices were a little cheaper we weren't to buy anything there. She said he tried to corner her once back in the day. Mom was also dead set against Home Depot. She said they had the wrong colors. We ended up going to Lowe's. Of course all those stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, are laid out the same way. Right across from the paint department was the tool section where Celine worked. Mom and her must have had it planned since the only time Mom had time to go to Lowe's to look at the colors was when Celine was working. I drive Mom over. She'd start looking at and talking about colors with the paint guy, 
but not before she told me to just take a break and walk around the store. I never got very far before Celine was at my side. She must have always gone on her break when she saw me because it was like she was always available. We'd talk a little. She'd show me the goodbyes and tell me about who she was dating. Then one day, it was me and mom's third trip when Celine got me beside the power saws and told me she'd stop dating around and was ready to settle down. She said it like this. Fiddling with a concrete blade for a circular saw, she said, You know, Michael, I'm through running around. I'm ready to settle down. I walked down to where the files were. She followed me, and standing beside the electric sander, she said, Did you hear me? I'm ready for you now. I picked up a sander and answered, I was ready before, but you ran off. How do I know you're sincere now? She turned me around. I was skinny and that was easy. She put her hands on my elbows and said, Oh, I'm ready, Michael. I really am. I wasn't sure. I guess the big question was David, so I said, What about my brother? She said, What about him? I said, Oh, come on, I know the only reason you dated me before was because you wanted to be nearby in case he came back. I don't think you loved me then, and I'm sure you don't love me now. She squeezed my elbows. She leaned up and whispered, Okay, I did date you because you're David's brother, but it's you I love now. I told her, I don't believe you. She said, Honestly, I did used to think about David when I was out with you. And to tell the truth, I still think about him sometimes. But Michael, it's like I just said. I love you now. I still wasn't so sure. You know for me to believe that I'm going to need a real commitment. Something that shows me you really do love me. She answered, Take me out and I'll prove it to you. I said, Okay, how about next Friday night? She leaned up and gave me a quick kiss, Friday night, she said, and just like that she scampered away. I went back to where mom was. She'd already finally ordered all the paint she wanted. I asked her, did you pick the colors you wanted? She smiled and said, yes, sweetie, I did. They're all right here. I looked down and she had four five-gallon pails of white paint on a cart. I said, mom, they're all white. She asked me, did you and Celine patch things up? I looked at her and just said, shit. We loaded the paint and went home. I started painting the house but never really finished. Celine and I started dating again, but she wasn't into making the kind of commitment I wanted. I'd had Marge and knew what I wanted. Finally, after our third date, I confronted her. Celine, I want more than just a tit. I want something I can really enjoy. She smiled and said, How about a hand job? My first thought was screw that. I wanted the real thing. But then I thought, where did that comment come from? I told her, Hell no. I want more than that, a lot more. She got all befuddled acting and said, I could maybe get you a BJ? The red flags went up then. I said, Celine, if you love me, you'll give me what I really need. She whispered, no, I can't do that. I said, why not? She said, not before we're married. I was getting pissed and told her, no, I can't wait. She broke down then. If I gave it up to you, then you'd know. Shit, I thought. I said, no, what? I watched her as she started to cry. I wasn't sure. I didn't think they were real tears. I'd learned that much. She was crying, or pretending to, when she said, I can't let you have it. I don't have it anymore. Then she really did start to cry. I said, what is this big you don't have anymore? I knew what it was, but I seriously didn't believe she'd sold out. She collapsed. Tommy Sheldon got me. Got you. I wasn't giving in an inch. She wailed. Oh, Michael, you know. Tommy Sheldon took my cherry this past summer. She started talking fast, as fast as I ever heard her. I was so mad at you. You started dating that 304 Marge Vogel. I knew what you two were doing. I swore I'd get even, but the only way I could was, was to. You know? No, I didn't know. I told her, that's bullshit. You let Tommy Sheldon have sex with you because he had a membership at the swim club. He screwed you because he had a new car. Besides, I know the truth. David got you before he left. She stopped crying. No, Tommy sort of got me. And yes, it was because I wanted to go swimming every day, but David never got me. Oh, Michael, you hate me now, don't you? I'm so sorry. I promise I'll make it up to you. I'll be your girl from now on. I'll do anything you want. We weren't far from her house when all this went down, so I said, you'll do anything? She wiped her eyes and said, anything. I'll do whatever you want. She leaned forward to kiss me. I love you, Michael. Only you. I said, anything? Anything, Michael. You can even have sex with me any ways possible. I thought, what the hell? I said then, if you'll do anything. She was nodding her head yes. I said, then get the hell out of my car and never speak to me again. She stopped. Michael? Go find Tommy Sheldon. Or whoever you last screwed. Screw everybody at Lowe's. Screw that guy at Sears. But just get the hell out of my goddamn car. She leaped back and away. 
Michael, you don't. You can't. I yelled at the top of my lungs. Get the hell out of my car. She got out and I burned up the street getting away from her. I found an older friend. He bought me a fifth of Jack Daniels and I proceeded to get as drunk as I could. I realized what I'd done. I'd done the one stupidest thing no guy should ever do. I'd save the stupid bitch for somebody else. All those goddamn times we were so close and I pulled back because she'd whimper or say something. Good old Tommy Sheldon never pulled back. No, sir. And I bet a dozen other guys never pulled back either. I was one stupid moron. Never again. I'd never let that happen again. I'd find and screw everything I could. Screw Celine. Screw Tommy Sheldon. Screw my mom. Well, not her, but screw everybody else, and for sure screw David wherever he was. I went to work. Not just at school. Not on painting my parents' house. Not on some bullshit part-time job. And for sure not for Celine. Never Celine. I started my great quest. I was going to find and screw every girl I knew, had known, or would ever know. I thought about that big dead guy who played for that NBA team who said he'd screwed 20,000 women. No wonder he was dead. Well shit. I never played basketball. Not that well anyway. But I bet I could screw a measly 20,000 women. From that day forward, I made it my mission to get as many girls as I could. It didn't take me long to find out how easy it was. First, as it turned out, I was pretty popular. Maybe Marge had left a note on a bathroom wall somewhere. Maybe the girls actually liked me. Or maybe all the women out there were just as horny just as promiscuous, and just as amoral as Celine. I did what my brother told me. I treated dating and screwing like I was looking for a job. If one turned me down, I just moved on to the next. Pretty soon I had a bevy of regulars, girls, and some older women who I could count on. Some liked it slow with lots of affection. Others liked it hard and fast. While a few others needed to be whined, dined, and told how special they were. I didn't care. I did them all. Disease? Was I worried about disease? Sure. Wasn't everybody? That's why they sold rubbers. I was careful. For me it wasn't so much the sex, or the fun of it. It was mostly about getting even. I didn't know or care who I was paying back. I only knew I had to spear as many fish as I could. This went on for weeks, months even. However, even the most licentious man, the worst libertine gets tired after a while. Sex that is the screwing, the BJs, the jamming my meet-up girls' holes gets tiresome after a while. I had to admit it. I was kidding myself. Still, I would have have probably gone on until I either caught something or some husband or boyfriend caught me. What stopped me was Celine. Well, not exactly Celine, but my mom and a late Friday night phone call. I'd been to my classes and already stopped at the bowling alley where I'd picked up a girl I knew. Who it was didn't matter. We both got off in the back of my old Chevy S10 Blazer. I'd taken her home, kissed her goodnight, and driven to my parents to clean up for work the next morning. I was upstairs taking a shit when I heard the phone ring. I didn't know where my cell was. I think it was downstairs someplace, but that time of night phone calls were usually for me. I was wiping my bum with the Charmin when my mom called upstairs. She said I needed to get out to Bear Creek Road pronto. I yelled down and asked her why. She yelled back that Celine was out there and needed a ride home. I yelled down and told mom to tell her she could find someone else. Mom yelled back up and said that she was crying. She sounded almost hysterical. She said some guy took her out there and tried to assault her. She'd fought him off but that she was pretty messed up and her parents weren't home. Celine was an only child, and a spoiled one at that. If her parents weren't home, and she was desperate enough to call my parents then she must be in a pretty bad fix. I yelled down and told my mom to tell Celine I'd be out as soon as I could. My mom yelled back that I should hurry since it sounded like Celine was really off. Well I'm not going to say I didn't hurry because I did, but I sure didn't want to. It was pretty lonely out around Bear Creek Road. It crossed several streams, and I knew of at least one old bridge that had been brought down by flooding a few years back. I had no idea where exactly I was going. It took me about a half hour to get to the road, and I must have driven around for 20 minutes before I found her. Brother was she a mess. Bear Creek Road is one of those old country paths that carve up the backcountry around the southwestern part of our state. The region is lightly populated, heavily forested, and not the best place for a city girl like Celine to be lost. I found her. She didn't look like she was hurt much. Mostly her self-esteem, I guessed. I asked her, What the hell are you doing way out here? She was behaving all confused and disoriented, but she managed to tell me a little. She said, I don't know exactly. I'm sure glad you came. I knew you would. I can't remember. I think I was with Tommy, and he wanted to show me a fishing spot he'd found. I couldn't believe any of the shit she was piling on me. Celine, that's all bullshit. You hate fishing. Christ, I can't think of the times I begged you to go with me. You always had some excuse. She looked all bewildered. I don't remember. 
We were at a dance. Tommy belongs to a club or something. He wanted me to go with him. There were a lot of kids at first, but then I looked around and all the girls were gone. It was just like five or six boys. We weren't at the dance. I don't remember going any place. They all wanted me to dance for them. I got scared and started yelling I think. I really can't remember. Celine's not a very good liar, and she sounded garbled and all at odds with herself. I asked her, did you have anything to drink? Did you eat anything? She was sitting on her but in the mud on the side of the road. She didn't act like she wanted to get up. She said, I think I had some wine. I might have had something else. It tasted sweet. They gave me some food too. I don't remember what it was, but it tasted garlicky. That's when I saw the unmistakable traces of semen on her blouse. Jesus that made me mad. She wasn't being helpful, but it sounded like either Tommy or one of his friends had given her something. If this had been the Celine from a few months back I'd have sworn she'd never have taken anything, but this girl was like no one I knew. It sounded like someone had loaded her up with ecstasy, or worse that molecular stuff, that Molly. Ecstasy would have been enough, but had it been a good dose of Molly she, or I should say we'd be lucky she was still alive. I leaned down and helped her up. She didn't seem any the worse for wear except for a few scratches, some torn clothes, and a little mud. I could see where someone had tried to get her bra off, and her slacks had been torn. I guess she must have put up a pretty good fight. A good enough fight to scare off the likes of Tommy Sheldon. I looked around and found her purse. I used my cell phone to call hers and found it near a puddle in the ditch beside the road. I was no linebacker or anything, more a skinny fully equipped Lance Armstrong I guess, but I managed to pick her up and carry her to my car. I laid her in the back and covered her with the comforter i just used myself with another girl a few hours earlier. I took my handkerchief, spit on it, and wiped the grime off her face. By the time I'd done that she was already fast asleep. I hopped in behind the wheel and drove her back to my parents. My mom was up waiting for us when I got back with Celine. Mom took one look at her and nearly got hysterical. Dad was up. He calmed mom down while I brought in Celine and put her on the living room sofa. She was still fast asleep. It was then I got really worried. I told my mom, I don't know what's wrong. She was out with some guys and I think they gave her something. Maybe we should take her to the emergency room? Dad agreed, and the four of us piled in my car. Mom and Dad in the front I got in the back holding what I considered a comatose Celine. The hospital was close by, and we got there in just a few minutes. I wondered how long she'd been in the condition she was in, but she had been talking when I found her. I kept thinking about all the girls I'd read about who'd been drugged and ended up dying someplace or spending years in a coma. Honest to God I was scared. Let's just say I had a come to Jesus moment. I didn't care who'd screwed her I only knew that I loved her and she could be in some serious danger. I also knew what a spoiled self-centered little twit she'd always been. Good Catholic, good student, well-behaved girl or not, she'd always been able to get whatever she wanted. I was as guilty of that as anybody I guess. We got her to the hospital. I told the triage nurse what I thought and they took her right in. I asked them what they would do but got nowhere. They just told me to go sit down. They let my mom and dad go back, but not me. Damn it. I suddenly realized what the medical people thought when they saw me. I was at least as muddy as Celine. We were the same age, and I bet they thought I'd given her whatever it was that was making her sick. Jesus, they were even calling the police. I sat down with my cell phone and started calling around. I was going to find that pig Tommy Sheldon and beat his bum. And if Celine died, I was going to kill him. It took me several tries, but I found a friend who knew Sheldon's cell phone number. I called and got him. The son of a witch was home watching TV. I told him where I was, who was with me, and how if he didn't get his scum sucking but down to the hospital right away I'd kill him. He started in with all this bravado bullshit about he wasn't afraid of me and how he could kick my butt. I told the creep that it didn't matter since there was spunk on her blouse, and that I bet it was his, and if she died, they'd haul his stupid butt in. The dumb shithead hung up his phone. Meanwhile the doctors and nurses were in and out. They kept looking at me like I was Albert D. Salvo or something. The police arrived, and one of the nurses pointed at me. There were two of them, a man and a woman. They walked right over. I held up my hand and said, I'm an ex-boyfriend. She called my parents and I found her. I didn't do this, but I can tell you who did. It was just then some foreign doctor came out and said something to one of the nurses. She came over to us and asked, Are you Michael Sullivan? I nodded. She said, Celine's awake. She's been delirious and crying. She's been asking for you. She keeps saying you saved her life. She's groggy, but we think she'll be all right. I looked at the police. We all right? Can I go in? The female policeman said, You have a name? I told them Michael Sullivan. The woman policeman said, The name of the person who might have accosted her. I said, Oh, Tommy Sheldon. 
Then I realized what an a-hole I must have looked like. I could tell she thought I was some kind of idiot or something. I got my shit together and said, My name's Michael Sullivan. She was out with a creep named Tommy Sheldon. He's been taking advantage of her for months. I think there's semen on her blouse. It might be his. The female cop looked at her partner. Try to find this Sheldon. She looked at the nurse. Could we have her blouse? I asked the police person again. Can I go see my old girlfriend? The policewoman nodded. I didn't need a second vote. I was on my way. When I got to her cubicle I saw she was only barely awake. I walked up and stood beside her. Celine saw me with half-opened eyes. She reached for my hand. I held it out. I could barely hear her when she said, I love you. I stood there and held her hand for like I guess a year. It was only a couple minutes actually. Then this doctor I could barely understand started talking to me. He told me Celine was lucky. They didn't know how much of what it was they'd given her, but mixed with the alcohol and her diminutive size it could have killed her. He said she might be alright in a few days, she might not. He said the stuff the kids are using nowadays is frightful. It's as bad as heroin, maybe worse. He said she might walk out of the hospital tomorrow completely well. She might be permanently brain damaged. He said if there was brain damage, it wouldn't necessarily impair her motor skills, but it could affect her ability to make reasoned judgments. The doctor scared the living shit out of me. Celine had always been a nice girl, a sweet person. Sure she was stupid. More silly and immature than anything. She was someone I could have killed a hundred times. She'd really hurt me in the past, and she almost always pissed me off, but I never wanted her to be hurt. I knew she, and I would have to have a long talk. They got a hold of Tommy Sheldon. He denied everything. The sticky stuff on her blouse did turn out to be semen, and he admitted it was his. I was pissed at Sheldon and privately vowed to get his ugly butt, but I was relieved Celine was all right. Celine was back home by Monday. I was at her house Monday evening after classes. We had some things to talk about. Her mother and father were home when I got there. They were glad to see me. Celine's dad shook my hand. God, I'm proud of you, Michael. She could be dead now if it wasn't for you. Her mom expressed the same opinion. We three sat in the living room while Celine waited for me in their club room downstairs. I told them, Celine's someone I've always had feelings for. You guys know that, but the truth is we're like oil and water. I think she cares about me as much as I do her, but we just can't get along. I was mistaken. Celine wasn't downstairs. She was in their kitchen. She hollered in, that's not true. We both love each other. The problem is we're too much alike. I got up, Mr. and Mrs. Campanaris would you excuse me please? I'd like to go talk with your daughter if you two don't mind. Both mother and father nodded at each other then at me. Mr. Campanaris said, be our guest. I strolled back in the kitchen and found Celine seated at their kitchen table. She was sipping a glass of wine. I glared at her. What do you think you're doing? She glared back. I'm having a glass of wine. Why? Damn it, Celine, if you hadn't been half drunk the other night, Sheldon wouldn't have been able to pull the shit on you he did. Jesus, Celine, he could have killed you. She took another sip and smugly replied, I'm not with Tommy Sheldon now, am I? I'm with you, and you'd never take advantage of me. Christ, Celine, I hollered, you're one stupid broad. I've been screwing girls and taking advantage of them at every opportunity ever since you pulled the, oh, Tommy got me trick. She got up and dumped the rest of her wine in the sink. First, she said, don't talk so loud or my mother and father will hear you. And second, I lied about Tommy Sheldon. Nobody's ever gotten me. I made it all up to make you mad. I didn't believe her. I wanted to, but I knew I couldn't. I told her, you sure were convincing when you told me he did. I find it hard to believe now. She came over and sat in the chair right beside me. She took her two hands and held my right hand. Do you want me to prove to you I'm a virgin? I smirked. Look, that's not possible and you know it. You're almost 20 and you haven't been living in a bubble. I've seen you horseback riding. I've watched you play field hockey and soccer and volleyball. You've done too many things. If you've got a hymen, I've got three balls. She used her right hand to stroke up and down my arm. She wasn't looking at me. A dead giveaway that what was coming next wasn't true. She said very quietly, Oh, I may not have one of those, but I'm telling you nobody's ever got inside me. I mean deep in, then she added, in either place. I wasn't buying, yeah well how many guys have enjoyed your BJ? How many hand jobs is it, 50? She pulled her hands back. Not that many, and only Tommy. I would have done David. I looked at her. There was that faraway look again, David, I said. It's always about David in the end, isn't it? I watched her cringe at that one. She still had that, woe-be-gone look. He was my first boyfriend. Then she brightened up. I saw the Celine I always wanted. But you're going to be my last. I mean it. 
No more Tommies or Davids or... I saw the look and the hesitation. She was going to mention at least one more, but stopped short. I provided the name. And Jerry, right? She looked surprised. She recovered quickly though and replied, yeah, and Jerry too, but he only felt me up. I shrugged. I'm so reassured. I had to hit home with her or I knew everything else. If there ever was going to be an everything else would be a waste of time. See here, Celine. You know how I feel about you. I've been with other girls. She cut me off. Yeah, like that Marge Vogel. Then I cut her off. Yeah, her and others too. But. I say, but I've always loved you. And I didn't see Marge until after you decided you wanted to run around. You remember that? She wanted to fight. Yeah, what about those tutor? I held up my hand to keep her from interrupting. Listen, Celine, I'm doing very well in school. I'm way ahead of the curve with the tech stuff right now. I've got a good foundation for my classes on business management. When I get out of college, I think I'll do pretty well. But I've got to stay in school. If you want me, you're going to have to stand beside me. Not behind me. Not hiding someplace around the corner. And you've got to be there for me. Just me. I've got to be able to trust you. Right now, I don't. She sat back. Okay. I understand. So, Michael, I have an idea. I was slightly incredulous. You do? She got up and went to the sink. She got a glass, filled it with water, and drank it down. Let's start over. I'm still only 19. I've only been out of high school a few months. So I've been stupid. I've been immature. I know I'm spoiled. So I'm guilty. I've been a bad person. But I'm still the same girl you fell in love with. You're the same boy. I got up then too. You mean start over, like from scratch? Yes, she said. Go home. Wait a few days and call me up. Ask me out. It'll be a brand new start. Michael, I promise you won't be sorry. I smirked. I took my right index finger and pushed it back and forth between my left thumb and left index finger. And what about? She didn't move. She watched my finger action and then said, A first date's a first date. I won't be easy, but I promise you, Michael Sullivan, I'll give you everything you want. Everything? I asked. She looked at me, and I could tell she was dead on serious. I mean it. Don't push it, but you'll get everything you want, and more. I wondered what that meant. I started toward her to give her a kiss. She backed away. She put her hands up, palms out. No, you haven't even asked me out yet. I stopped. Okay, I'm going home. Starting tomorrow, it's a fresh start. She nodded. Fresh start. I walked out of their kitchen, through their dining room, into their living room, through the foyer to the front door. I looked back at the Campanarises. I waved and said, see you soon. They looked back and forth at each other. Mrs. Campanaris said, see you soon, Michael. I opened the door and left. I went home and waited a week before I called for our first date. I had some things on my mind. First, we'd known each other for nearly four years. Oh, we'd been acquaintances earlier, but direct first-hand intercourse only dropped us back to my junior year in high school. She'd been a sophomore. I was halfway through my sophomore year of college now. We'd had our share of arguments, makeups, and day-to-day -day good and bad times. I wanted to pack all that away in a mental folder and leave it. If we were going to make a go of this, we sure couldn't dig up or dig at old wounds. I sure wouldn't. Second, we both had our ghosts. Celine had already brought up Marge, and there were other girls she could have mentioned too. I had my ghosts to contend with also. Guys like Tommy Sheldon and Jerry Ahole Myers had been hanging around her like two buzzards the last few months, and I had to put them out of my mind. Of course, the real ghost wasn't any of her current crop of suitors. It was my brother. His past presence haunted me like a dark shade. I love my brother, but honestly, I hoped he'd never come home. Then last there was the big question. Did I love her enough to try to make a new start work? The answer to that was easy. Yes, I did love her. I loved her with all my heart, but I was still a man. I'd work to make things good, but this was a two-way street. She had to pull her weight too, and that meant for me no competition. We were two about to become one. There wouldn't be any room for anybody else. I called her up and set a date. I kept it as light as possible. I said, Hi, is this Celine Campanaris? She answered, Yes, is this Michael Sullivan? I said, Yes, it is. I thought I'd give you a call. I have these three $20 bills, and they're burning a hole in my pocket. I was wondering if you'd like to help me spend them. Celine answered, I can spend money, Michael. That's one of my favorite hobbies. How would you like to waste it? I thought maybe a light dinner, and perhaps a spin around the ice rink. Celine liked ice skating. She was good at it. I'd like that a lot. Did you have a day or time in mind? I replied, this Friday night, say I pick you around 6 o'clock. She exuded, sounds great. See you then. I hung up and thought, well that went well. And so began my second courtship of Ms. Celine Campanaris.
We did all the things I knew she liked. We went skating. I took her to the movies. We stopped in at the college student union for snacks and talk. We went for long drives in the country. We spotted an owl once and made regular trips back to keep tabs on him. We both kept everything light and airy. Long about the time spring semester began we were moving into phase two, the more intimate stage of our second courtship. I was careful. I didn't want to push her. She was good with this and didn't fight me off when I did get a little intimate. Along with the increased physical intimacy came other things. We talk about the future. We talked about what we both wanted, what we wanted to see happen. We talked about kids and family and God. Celine was deeply religious. She confided once she'd even thought about becoming a nun and going to some distant land and doing good deeds. To me, that was mildly disconcerting since Celine's always been someone who's easy to read. Like I said, I could always tell when she was dissembling. She hadn't been fabricating anything when she talked about becoming a nun. I realized she was a lot more complicated than I thought. The comments she'd made about Tommy and her being sexual and then her later retraction. I could believe her. Celine was more than just another pretty girl. No, she wasn't just some cute little coquette. There was substance there. But the David thing, that had been real too, and I still worried about that. Celine had changed in other ways too. Over the last year she'd filled out more. Her boobs were more fulsome, and her thighs more meaty. I loved it. She'd grown an inch too. I figured she was closer to 5 feet 5 inches maybe 5 feet 6 inches now. I loved her hair, that she'd continue to let it grow, and what she did with it. Her complexion was like melted butter. By that I mean she had a soft yellowish olive glow. No freckles, no pimples. Just that perfect clear complexion only girls who could trace their ancestry to southern Italy had. Physically she was perfect. Personality had always been her strongest point. The sweet bubbly Celine I'd fallen in love with in high school never left. But now there was a polished maturity. If I made a misstatement or said something crass, stupid, or brash she seemed to find a way to take a bad thing and refine it. Add a level of feminine gentility to things she'd never done before. Oh the fiery temper burst through frequently, but the flames didn't smolder and stink up the environment. She'd blow up at something, and then just as quickly burst into gales of laughter about her, or my, silliness. She'd always been fun to be around. Now more than ever I found her more than just fun. She was warm and sensitive. My Celine was becoming a true woman. I only hoped I was keeping pace. By then I realized she was the more mature one. She'd kept her job at Lowe's. But now instead of spending her money as fast as she made it she was putting some aside. Me, I was in school studying all the time. She gave me my space. She supported me in my schoolwork. I found her more than just a girlfriend. She'd buy me supplies, new electronic equipment, and she was doing as much studying about the newest technologies as I was. She was more than a girlfriend. She was a helpmate. Together we were becoming a real team. Near the end of my sophomore year I decided we were ready for the next step. There'd been no real sex. Sure there'd been some petting. And we put the friends with partial benefits idea to good use. We learned we could make each other happy without risking a baby. One time something happened that I found pretty stressful. I dwelt on it far longer than I should have. We'd been out. I'd had my wallet out and had inadvertently left it on her mom's kitchen counter. It was late, and her parents were in bed. Celine scooped up my wallet and laughingly asked, What have we here? I chuckled, held out my hand and said, Okay, hand it back. She said, Not yet. Next, I knew she was going through my wallet. She had all my cards out. There wasn't anything unusual, triple A, visa, driver's license, library card, the usual. Then she flipped to the sections where I kept my pictures. Sure. There was mom and dad, an old picture of me and David. What threw her off was a whole bunch of pictures of her. I guess maybe six of them from times and places she never knew I was around. She handed me my wallet back and quietly went on to talk about something else. Not me though. I reached over and grabbed her purse. I found her wallet and went to work. I didn't fool around with the cards. I went straight for the pictures. There were the usual mom and dad things. Pictures of some cousins and a set of grandparents. But when it came to me, I didn't see anything. I remembered I'd given her one of my graduation pictures, but it wasn't there. There was one somebody's picture there. Yeah, she had David's and it looked well used, like somebody'd held quite a lot. There was something written on the back, but I never got a chance to read it because she yanked it out of my hand. Then something occurred to me. She'd been to our house a lot. She'd been in my room. She'd seen all the stupid shit I had, the magazines, the model planes, the stacks of CDs, and stuff, but I'd never been in her room, not once. I didn't think. I reacted. I jumped up and went straight for the stairs. I took each step two at a time. Celine was right behind me. 
I pushed right into her room. It was like someone had stabbed me. Stabbed me right in the stomach. It was pretty much the way I thought a girl's room should look. Dolls, trim, doilies, lots of feminine things. There was a picture by her bed on her bedstead too. It was an old picture from years past. It was a picture of her and David. I made a brief look around. Not a single picture of me. Not one anywhere. I turned. She was standing behind me. I saw the look. I recognized it. Nothing had changed. It was David. It had been David all the time. I sidestepped her and made my way downstairs, out the door, out to my car, and then home. It was over. I couldn't have been in my parents' house more than five minutes before I heard a car pull up. I was in full almost cry, depths of despair mode when I looked out the front window. Celine had followed me home. She clambered up my parents' front, across the wooden porch, into the front room, and right in front of me. She was crying, no, she said, you're wrong. It's not him. She had a bunch of pictures in her hands. She threw them at my feet. They were all of David. Okay. It was stupid. I never thought. I didn't get a chance to respond. She rushed into my arms. She pulled my arms so they were wrapped around her waist. I tried to back away. I really tried. She wouldn't let me. She pulled my face down to hers and started kissing me. She pushed and marched and backpedaled me into my parents' living room and together we fell on their sofa. As we fell backwards, I glanced at the clock. It was quite late. Celine had my shirt open and over my head before I realized what was happening. My belt buckle was unhitched and my pants were being pulled down. I went for her blouse. Two minutes later, we were naked on my parents' couch. She started out on top, but pretty quickly she had me on top. We were face to face. I never saw her eyes quite like that. All I saw were pupils. Three seconds later, I was inside her. It was over almost as fast as it started. I had no control. I didn't know if she did anything or not. I never asked, not then, and not later. For several minutes I lay on top while she held me. She had her arms wrapped around me so tight I found it hard to breathe. It was as though she was afraid to let me go. Eventually she loosened her grasp. I sat up, and she rolled over next to me. I was a nervous wreck, and though she looked the most disheveled I'd ever seen her she seemed in total control. She was deathly quiet when she said, You're mine, understood? I nodded. She got up, got dressed, and left. We never discussed that little interlude. In fact, nothing like that happened again for months. Over the following days and weeks, she was just as determined to keep me at bay as ever. It was like it never happened. I remember after she left I spent several minutes trying to clean up the mess on the sofa. A normal person I suppose would have been convinced. I wasn't a normal person. Her behavior didn't make me feel more secure. I felt less secure. But we moved on. At last in June. Right after sophomore classes ended, I managed to arrange a full clan meeting. I got my mom and dad, Celine's parents, and hers all together one afternoon at the local diner. It was my treat. I think everyone but Celine knew what the real reason for the food was. We were just finishing dessert and having a coffee when I reached in my pocket and pulled out the tiny box that held the ring. I was seated between her mom and mine. Celine was across the table. I didn't get up and do the big on the knee thing. Not yet anyway. I just quietly and I like to think nonchalantly, placed the little box on the table and slowly used my index finger to slide it towards Celine. At first she didn't realize what it was, then she did. She didn't jump up and down. No one heard a lot of oohs in AHS. There weren't any mushy tears. She recognized the box for what it was and just smiled this beautiful, sweet, gracious smile at me. She reached across the table and, ignoring the box, placed her tiny hand on mine. She emitted a barely audible whisper, yes. It was then that I got up and walked around the table. I knelt on the floor beside her, opened the box she now held in her hand, took out the ring and placed it on her finger. My mom started clapping. Celine's mother had her handkerchief out and was crying. Celine, well Celine, looked at the minuscule quarter carat solitaire, turned and smiled and kissed me on the cheek. She murmured, I love you. I kissed her back, but on the lips. I said it then, you'll make me happy and marry me? She smiled some more and said, you know I will. Then her father hailed the waitress, got a bottle of some kind of red wine, and we all had a toast. By then her mother and my mom were chattering away about the wedding. Her mother said they'd probably have to let her wedding dress out since Celine was a little more buxom than she'd been. I'd never thought of that, but it seemed to be a foregone conclusion. Celine would be wearing her mother's wedding dress, it had been her grandmother's years before. Celine's grandparents on her mother's side were both dead. Her grandfather had fought in Vietnam. He'd married Celine's grandmother just before he'd gone away. Celine's mom had worn the same dress. Now it was Celine's turn. 
My mom said she had some jewelry that had been in her family a long time, and that Celine would get it. I thought of David. He was the older brother, but he wasn't around. Maybe I was being selfish, but I wanted my mom's jewelry. The afternoon dinner broke up. Celine and I drifted off to my car. We went for a ride. We talked about my college, buying a house someday, how many kids we'd have. None of it was new. Celine was an only child. She said she wanted a big family. I didn't care. I told her we'd have as many as she wanted. I felt so good. We held hands in the car. I hated the modern motor companies. I hated their bucket seats. That summer was stupendous. I found a great job that made a lot more than minimum wage. Celine was a supervisor in the tool department. Lowe's was promoting women, and Celine was at the right place at the right time. She was starting to make pretty good money. Junior year loomed ahead. We seemed to be on our way. What's that old saw? We make plans and we got pregnant. Celine had a problem with birth control pills, so we relied on her diaphragm and spermicide, and it worked. We got married the very end of July. We went on a short honeymoon to Niagara Falls, and we came back home. Her parents and mine got together, bought us some used and some new furniture. Mr. and Mrs. Campanaris had a small apartment above their standalone garage. When we got home, we were all set up to play house. It was wonderful. Celine went back to work. I had another decent summer job. We started saving for my fall tuition. Everything was great. Fall came and Celine and I were like the perfect team. I was back in classes with and, thanks to Mr. Campanaris, a good paying part-time job in the evenings that required few real on the job hours. I was at a job site just 15 minutes from home. I had so much free time, I was able to get most of my studying in before getting home. The teachers assigned a lot of research for several projects, but Celine was right there on the internet day and night filling in the gaps and helping me out. At Lowe's Celine's top supervisors had fallen in love with her, and she was soon in line for another promotion and more responsibility. Her supervisors were good people. One an older man, the other a youngish woman so I wasn't worried about any job site coercion or any of that other hankapanky husbands sometimes have to contend with. Yes things looked rosy for the young Sullivan family. Things looked so good that one evening we all decided to get together for another one of those warm and friendly family dinners at the local diner. Celine and I were so excited we thought we'd have a quickie before her mother and father came for us. We were just finishing up when we heard them downstairs outside the garage. Celine did her thing with the diaphragm and off we went. Of what a night. What a beautiful April night. I ordered haddock and Celine got lobster. Life was good. Shortly thereafter we finished my spring semester. Grades were excellent. Celine got a raise and I, again with Mr. Campanaris's help, got a really good summer job. One more year and I'd have my diploma. Companies in the area were already talking to me. When Celine missed May we didn't think a thing of it. But when June rolled around and Celine started feeling a little off her oats we knew something was brewing. She and I talked it over. It had to have been the night we went out with our parents. Celine had been careful, but careful is a tricky word. Careful meant diaphragm and spermicide, not just diaphragm. We were about to become, heck we already were, a growing family. There was never any question about keeping the baby. Sure we could have gone the abortion route, but we'd get to think about it for the next 50 years. We knew we'd never be able to handle the what-ifs. Both sets of parents were moderately pleased. They approved of our decision to keep the baby, but they weren't so happy that we'd been a tad careless. Celine and I did the numbers. With luck we'd get through the fall of my senior year, but it looked like that last semester would take a little longer. The way Celine mapped it out, I'd be done all my undergraduate work about six months later than the original plan. That of course included babysitting from both soon-to-be grandmothers. So we marched through the summer. Celine set up the Lamaze classes. She reorganized our tiny apartment. Together we hit the yard sales and used furniture shops. Our grandparents looked through their attics, and pretty soon we had the all the baby stuff we'd need right down to the diapers. Oh did we scrimp and save, but it was for a common cause. We were living the purpose-driven life. Man it was great. Fall came and I was back in school. We fixed it so I'd have a heavier load. Anything to get the job done as soon as possible. Those were some wonderful times. I guess it's a little egotistical, but I was really proud to be attending the Lamas classes. Celine was such a pretty pregnant mother, to be I just burst with joy. I remember the first sonogram, the first kick, the time we found out our baby was going to be a girl. We went through a million books trying to decide on the perfect name. Celine even started talking about saving for the baby's college education. What a great time. Celine was pregnant, and she never looked more beautiful. She really blossomed. I'd loved her before, but with the baby coming I was walking on air. She was a wonderful wife and the greatest daughter and daughter-in-law. I knew when the time came she'd be the best mother ever. 
I'm not saying it was all pink and rosy. There was the morning sickness, the crying jags, trips for the store for odd food choices, fears regarding birthing problems, uncertainty about birth defects, and her uncertainty about her weight and post-birth shape. Yeah, we worried about all the things pregnant families worried about, but we did it together and didn't miss mass. Not once. For sure, I hadn't been a Catholic, but changing denominations was a small thing for me. Celine wanted everything to be just right, and if that meant doing it Catholic then I said, go for it. Come on, Celine Sullivan. Nay Campanaris was my little goddess. I worshipped her. The blessed day came. Our baby arrived at 11.03 a.m., January 11th. She was our precious little Sira Angelina Fiametta Sullivan. She came in at 6 pounds, 7 ounces. She was 19 inches on the nose. A perfect brand new baby. A clean and fresh new human being. I looked at Celine holding our perfect adorable little bundle, and I was the happiest man alive. My brother David had been gone about four years when Sira arrived. That was just about how long one term of enlistment was in the Navy. I never gave it much thought. David had been gone so long, and nobody'd heard from him. I'd almost forgotten I had a brother. Mom called me around one o'clock in the afternoon. She was all excited. Guess what, Michael? What, Mom? Did we win the lottery? No, David's home. He just got in. My mind did a tumble sot. Old ghosts and old worries started to resurface. What was I going to say? What would Celine say? How would she feel? What would David say? I didn't think he had any claim on Celine. He was the one who'd run off, not her. Yeah, I was the one who'd stayed around. I was the one who'd picked up the pieces, applied the bomb, bore the pain. She was my girl. She was my wife. More bad vibes started to hatch out. At the time we'd started over, Celine had assured me she was a virgin, that there'd never been a Tommy Sheldon. I knew that was most likely a lie. I'd known it from the first time. Well, I guess I did. Oh, I was sure whatever she'd done hadn't been much, but I thought I knew uncharted ground from a previously plowed field. She may not have been plowed much, but I knew I hadn't been the first. But then who really knew? Or even cared? So David was home. Where would that take us? Celine was just getting out of the shower. It was near time for her to go to work. I called back, Hey Celine. She shouted out, Yes, sweetie? That was my mom. Guess who's back? She came in wrapped in a terry cloth robe with a towel swimming around her long black hair. Who? Do tell. I was careful. I tried to be casual, but I don't think I quite made it. David's back. I saw it. The look. Jesus, I thought. She's still carrying a torch. I'm not much into music, but I've always enjoyed country. Until they retired Alabama had been my all-time favorite group. That song, Old Flame, just jumped out at me. Christ. I remembered the lyrics. There's an old flame burning in your eyes. That tears can't drown and makeup can't disguise. Now that old flame might not be stronger but... I felt like I was going to be sick. Celine's split-second response disappeared. She replied, Really? When did he get back? A stone had fallen on my soul. I answered, Don't know. Mom just said he was back. Celine started walking back to our bedroom. As she walked back she said, We'll have to invite him over. You better check the baby, I think there's something in there. Smells like it. I heard her shuffling around getting dressed. She'd be gone in a few minutes. I got up, I'll check her now. While I checked the baby, and pretended to be busy Celine got ready for work. Ten minutes later she was gone. This was her 2 to 10 o'clock shift, so she'd be home about 10.30. Most employees left at 9 o'clock, but she was a supervisor and usually stayed a little longer. I had almost 9 hours to fret and worry. Thank God it was a Friday. She'd be back in at 8 o'clock the next morning. My work schedule had me in a little later at 9 o'clock, right after Mom Campanaris came over to keep an eye on Sira. We'd just started the spring term. I was taking two classes, and tonight was to be my night to study. After these two spring classes I only had a few more and I'd be done, and now David. What was I going to do? That problem was partly solved about an hour later. David showed up at our apartment. He was armed with a case of some kind of expensive beer. Of course, what with the baby we didn't allow alcohol in the apartment. I invited him in, but, Dave, I said, Mom just called and told us you were back. He grinned. I didn't like the grin. He said, yeah, just got out and thought I'd come home. He held up the beer, look at what I've got. I looked at the beer and smiled, looks great, but Celine doesn't like booze in the house, you know, the baby. Dave pushed right by me, come on Michael, it's me. Celine won't mind. Beer in tow, he walked on up the stairs to our place. I followed. We went to the kitchen. He went ahead and pushed two six-packs in the refrigerator. He unpacked a third, slipped the lid off one and handed it to me. Then he slipped the lid off another, 
and dropped it down his throat in what we used to call a torpedo. I thought, thank God Sira was asleep. David sat back. So what's up, little brother? I hear you married my girl. Even got a kid of your own now. Tell me how'd you do it. I watched him as he finished a second beer before I'd had a sip of my first. My mind was going a mile a minute. I didn't like his look. Well, maybe it was the Navy, but other guys had been in the Navy and didn't come back well. Looking like, shit, what's wrong with me? He's my brother. I should be glad he's back. Yeah, I should be ashamed, but I was prejudiced. He didn't know it. He was my enemy now, but still, he was my brother. Yet there was something about him. He didn't look just right. I'd seen the look around town. He had the look of, of. He had the look of an addict. He had that lean and hungry look Shakespeare described. I remember David was always kind of cavalier about and around to other people, but I think I saw a meanness in him now. I tried to remember. Had it always been there? He was thinner than I remembered, and I saw other things too. He had tattoos, but they were black tattoos, not the kind a professional artist would ink. Sailors had tattoos. In fact, tattoos were a fashion statement now. But I knew his tattoos. They were jailhouse tattoos. I wondered if he'd ever been in jail, if he'd even been in the Navy. I asked him, we haven't heard from you in four years. So tell me, how was the Navy? He smiled. No, it was more a snarl. Oh, the Navy. It was great, but I had to get out. Time to move on, you know? I pressed a little. Come on, Dave, for years. What did you do? Were you on a ship? He opened another beer. Yeah, I was on a carrier. Maybe you heard of it, the Ronald Reagan. Then he changed the subject. Mom told me you and Celine got married. Got a kid too, I hear. When'd you get married? What I guess she couldn't wait. Bet you had to, didn't you? I thought, where did that come from? I changed the subject back to the Navy. He'd driven up in what looked like a brand new car. I knew next to nothing about the type except that they were way out of our price range. I said, well, you must have done pretty well in the Navy. That's a classy car you've got. He turned his head. He wouldn't look at me. Yeah, I did all right. So mom said you got a baby girl. I took my second sip of beer. Want to see her? He smiled. No, it was more a smirk. Sure. Show me the baby. I got up, and he did too. I said, leave the beer here. He put the beer down. Sure, buddy. He followed me into the bedroom. Our bedroom doubled as a nursery. Celine, and I wanted to be close to Sira all the time. Celine was extra careful with the crib and stuff. We'd read up on things like SIDS. No, sir. No thick plastic liners or anything like that around our baby's head. No chance of an accident if we could help it. I walked David in and showed him our baby. He leaned down and looked at her. He looked awkward, uncomfortable. I could relate to that. He gave me an evil, I'd say malicious grin. I couldn't relate to that. He asked, she yours. That took me back. I was surprised he'd even think something like that. I tried to smile, but I know it didn't work. Oh, she's mine all right. He glanced over my head at our computer. Mind if I smoke? I was aghast. I answered, no, not here, not a chance. Celine and I don't smoke and never allow anything like that around our baby. I put a little extra emphasis on the hour in our baby. He stepped back. No shit. No booze and no smokes. What's this a prison? I grinned, but didn't mean it. No, it's our nursery. Thank God Sierra was didn't wake up. I took my brother's arm and steered him back to the kitchen. He offered no resistance. I felt his arm. I'm no muscle man. In fact, I'm skinny. Celine says I'm too skinny. She said once if a big wind came up, she'd lose a husband. Well, it might not be that bad, but for sure David's arm was nothing but bone. He felt emaciated. I walked him to the kitchen. I couldn't help but notice something else. I bet he knew more about what little we owned than I did. It was like he was casing the joint. We went back in. He asked me how I'd managed to swing it with Celine. I told him our story, but I left out the parts about Tommy Sheldon and our arguments. Then near the end of my sanitized version of our story, David said something that really floored me. He said, yeah, I remember Celine was a hot little piece. I'm glad you got to tap into it. I didn't say anything. He didn't say anything for a minute or two either, but by then he'd figured it out. Hey, Michael, I was just, hey, nothing happened between me. And, you know, nothing happened. It was my turn to smirk. This wasn't my brother. Yeah, I know she'd have told me if it had. He looked around at the refrigerator. He was on the last beer from the six-pack he'd first opened. I hadn't taken more than three sips from my first beer. He looked at me, then at the refrigerator, then back at me. Mind if I? I smiled. Yeah, you should take it with you. Celine would blow her mind if she saw it in there. He figured it out. I'd sent him on his way. He gave me another of those not really a smile smiles. Mom says you're a college boy? I replied, yeah, nearly through two. 
In fact, this is my study night. That had to be enough message. He got it. Yeah, I better blow. He got up and went to the refrigerator. Want me to leave you a couple? No, I said. Celine would kill me. He laughed then, a genuine laugh. Yeah, she could be a bitch. I mean, she could. I interrupted him. Yeah, I know. My one-time brother got his three six-packs of beer, tipped his hand in mock salute and started for the stairs. I walked him down and saw him off. I hurried back upstairs to check on Sierra. She was still asleep. I leaned in real close just to make sure she was okay. She was. I went back to where I kept my books and sprawled across the bed. I needed to study, but I wanted to stay close to my daughter too. I guess the old protective instincts, the old guard the household, were kicking into overdrive. I laid there across the bed and tried to read and study, but thoughts of my brother kept intruding. I wondered what it had been like when he was in the Navy. I wondered if he ever was even in the Navy. I saw through him. He was a troubled man, a dangerous man. How could he have changed so much? Then again, had he really changed or was it that I didn't see it when he was home when I was so much younger? I was less aware back then. He did things that, back then, seemed adventurous. Things I'd been too scared to do. It came through stark and clear. I couldn't trust him. I was confident Celine would see through him too. I reassured myself. Nothing to worry about. Sira started to squirm. I checked the clock. Yes, soon be time for a feeding. I got up. Celine got home her usual time. She saw the beer cans in the trash. That was my fault. I'd at first thought to throw them out, but then I thought I'd let Celine see them. Well, that was kind of smarmy, but she needed to see. Celine saw the cans. Where did those cans come from? David stopped by. He brought them. She gave me a quizzical look. You let him drink? Here, with the baby? Honest, I said. He kind of just slipped them by. I didn't get a chance to stop him. She gave me a cross look. I thought we agreed. No alcohol after the baby came. He jumped me, Celine. He got them in before I. She was tired and in no mood to argue. We'll have no more of that, okay? Sure, honey. I said, you're tired. Want me to give you a back rub? She half yawned, half frowned. No, just get the trash out. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I took the trash out. Came in and checked on Sira. She needed to be changed and I did it. By the time I got undressed and ready for bed, Celine was already down. We usually cuddled a little before we went off, but I guess not tonight. She wasn't asleep though. She said something to me. Celine was lying on her side under the covers with her head on her pillow, facing away from me. Your mom asked me to call her today? She did. Yes, so I called her on my break. You've seen David. Your mom's worried about him. Yeah, you know I saw him, but I didn't see anything to worry about. Celine rolled over. He's got brucellosis. Your mom said he got it while he was in the Mediterranean. They shipped him out on a medical. He could die. I thought about the guy I'd seen. He looked sickly but I doubted if it had anything to do with whatever it was he might have told mom. Mom said that? Yes, and she's worried. She wants us to help look out for him. Damn, I thought, the pig up to something. He whispered, Okowo. The house phone rang. It was a Saturday, and in spite of the fact it was probably some telemarketer I picked it up. It was my mom. Hello, Michael? Hi, mom. What's up? David's got brucellosis. I yawned. I hope mom didn't hear it. Yeah, I heard. Celine told me last night. We've got to help him, my mom replied. I'd looked the damn disease up on the internet earlier before Celine left for work. I showed her it was a bogus disease. David had pulled it out of thin air. Celine refused to believe me. I didn't expect much more from my mom, but I tried. Look mom this brucellosis thing is all in his head. I'm not saying he's lying. I'm saying he's mixed up. He's got other problems. Oh Michael, he's your brother. He should be getting veterans benefits. They should be treating him. They won't though. Haven't you been following the news? Veterans all over the country are getting the shaft. Now it's your brother. Mom was right about the veterans, but at the moment I wasn't sure David was a veteran. He'd run away four years ago. He said he was joining the Navy, then no one heard from him until the other day when he came back looking, to me anyway, like a heroin addict, and claiming he got something while serving our country. It didn't add up. That's not what I said. I told Mom, Mom you know we'll be here for him. Okay Michael, said Mom. He's going to need a lot of TLC, at least until he gets back on his feet. Not to worry, Mom. We're here. You know me. Thanks, honey. Look, I've got to go. Your brother's staying with us for now. He's back in his old room. I think he had a tough night. I hear him upstairs now, so I'm going to hang up and fix him some breakfast. Bye-bye. Mom hung up, so I did too. Shit, I thought. I bet he had a tough night. He left here with three six-packs. There's no beer in my parents' place. They don't drink the stuff. 
Oh yeah, I bet he had a tough night. He's more than likely hung over, or coming down off a high. I know what I've got to do. With just a little energy, anyone can find out almost anything about a person's past military record. If David's telling the truth, it'll be there. I'm not interested in the disease. Just if he was honorably discharged. If he was then I'll be there for him. If I can't find it, then well? Oh shit I realized if I didn't get a move on I'd be late for work. Mom Campanaris was walking over now. I loved that woman. She caught me while I was coming down the stairs. Michael we heard your brother's back. I said, yeah, he was by yesterday. She looked kind of funny. She said, you're not worried? You know about? She kind of hinted toward our apartment. I knew what she meant. I smiled. Of course not. Celine and I are married. She smiled back, but I didn't think she was sure. That scared me, just a little anyway. Well I'd done what I'd planned. I went to work, did my duty, came home and found Celine fixing something for dinner. David, my poor innocent brother was in my living room holding Sira. That caused me to involuntarily shudder. I walked in. Hey gang how's it going? Celine was trying to coax some olive oil over the bottom of a fry pan. She smiled at me. David's joining us for dinner. I thought we'd have some fried eggs and bacon. That's when I noticed the microwave was on. Guess that's where the bacon was. I hollered in the David. Where's your car? Is that your bike out there? David held up my Sierra and kissed her. He called back, sold the car, bought a used cycle. The car was a mistake anyway. I didn't like the way he was holding Sierra, but didn't say anything, overprotective I guessed. I thought about the car for a second. The car he'd been driving the day before had Indiana license plates. Gee. If he'd bought it out there wouldn't they have been temporary tags? Selling an almost new Audi for a grungy old motorcycle? It didn't add up, but then David didn't add up. Looks like a swell bike. I quipped. He hollered back, yeah, I always wanted one, but being at sea so much, what in the Navy? It would have been in storage most of the time. Hey Dave, I yelled back. What did you do in the Navy anyway? He shouted in, missile technology. I was on a missile frigate most of the time. Oh, I thought. I thought you said you were on a carrier, the Ronald Reagan? I was, but they needed someone who understood the missile tech, so I got switched. I see, I shouted back. Well that was bullshit, I thought. I looked in at Celine. She'd broken a couple eggs, not something normal for her, need any help? She happily replied, too happily, I thought. You can get the bacon out and put another batch in, and honey could you finish the eggs? I want to change Sira. I went in the kitchen, sure darling. I kissed her head and patted her behind as I walked past. She brushed my hand away as she went toward the living room. Cut it out, Michael. David might see. Shit, in my own house. I finished the eggs she'd broken and dropped in a couple more. They broke too. They say if the eggs are real fresh, they're more likely to break. I heard Celine and David leave the living room. They went back to our bedroom. I don't think David knew I could still hear. I heard him murmur to my wife, I missed you. Then I heard her, I missed you too. We all missed you. I thought about you all the time, he added. I guess I could have written. Celine whispered, a letter once in a while would have been nice. Then he seemed to mutter, I couldn't. After basic, they sent me to a special school. It was kind of incognito. Celine quietly asked, like a secret mission or something? In a low tone he said back, something like that. I can't discuss it, hush. Hush you know? I heard Celine again. I knew they didn't want me to hear. Gee no one knew. What he said next was garbled, but I got some of it. He said, they've sealed my military records. No one's supposed to know what I've been doing. I might be recalled. I missed the last, but I'd heard enough. Even if I did find anything on the net, he could say it was planted to throw people off. Damn this wasn't the Dave I remembered. Then I thought, maybe it was. The Dave I remembered never worried about schoolwork. He never worried about getting anywhere except into some girl's pants, or except other stuff. Yeah, I remembered. Dave did toy around with the druggies. He wasn't always Mr. Perfect. I'd gotten several eggs done, and the second batch of bacon was up. I yelled in, dinner's ready. Celine called, be right there. A minute later we were all at the kitchen table. Celine had Sierra's bassinet beside her. She was cooing and drooling and giggling. God she was beautiful. I glanced at Celine. She was the model of domesticity. Then I looked at Dave. He was looking at me, and I could see the jealousy. He smiled sweetly at Celine. You're a lucky girl. She looked fondly at our baby, then at Dave. She didn't look at me. She smiled back at my brother. I think so. I had to break the spell. Hey Dave, you remember in your senior year, and you had your license suspended? He looked from me to Celine. I didn't think she'd heard this story. Dave mumbled, uh huh. I added, 
Remember you bought Gary Upton's old Pontiac, but you couldn't get insurance so you couldn't get tags, and how you and your pal went into the city and found a car with some simple letters on the tag, and you guys stole the tag and you repainted the letters so it was like a new set, and then how you used it to drive at night. He shrugged. Yeah, I remember. I went on. I could see Celine hadn't heard this story, and I could see she didn't like it. You remember how you had like 20 gallons of stolen siphon gas in your trunk, and how you thought you needed new tires. So you and one of your pals picked out a car with good tires, and then how late at night you and he were going to jack up the car and steal the tires, but it was dark. And when you opened your trunk you couldn't find the lug wrench, so you lit a match, and then? David was sitting there stiff as a board. He hadn't touched his eggs, yeah, but that was a long time ago and? I interrupted. Man they said flames shot 20 feet in the air. I remember all the hair was burned off your face. Dad was so pissed. Then Celine interrupted. I thought you got burned when you pulled some woman out of her burning car. That's what you said? Dave interrupted her then. Well I lied about the car and the woman okay? Dave started shaking then. He said, I need one of my pills. He looked at Celine. Honey they're in my medicine kit. The green ones. Would you bring them here? Celine's demeanor had changed from suspicious curiosity to well-meaning former girlfriend. She jumped up and ran for his bag in the living room. While she was out Dave looked at me. I don't need your shit okay? I smiled. Gee. Just reminiscing. She came back with the pills and handed my brother the bottle. He was shaking while he opened the bottle and took three out. I need these to control my nerves. After what I did in the Navy. It's too terrible. He looked at Celine. Thanks, babe. She smiled at him and frowned at me. You shouldn't bring up those old stories from high school. That was all so long ago. We were all just kids. Yeah, I thought. Just kids. My memories were starting to clear. The hero across from me had feet of clay. I was just too young and dumb back then to see it. I looked at my wife. She was still in full worship mode. What was I going to do? We finished dinner, and shortly after Dave left. Celine had to work the next afternoon, but I didn't. Mom Campanaris would watch our baby. Celine and I would go to mass in the morning. I'd study in the afternoon while Celine put in her time. It was late winter, and they were prepping for the spring. Her being a manager meant extra work. We got baby tucked away, and we climbed into bed. Celine crawled over, and we cuddled. I whispered, I love you. She squeezed up even closer, I love you too. Then she added, let's have another. I murmured in her ear, give me another minute sweetie. She kissed my cheek and whispered, no, I mean let's have another baby. I stopped feeling amorous and leaned up on one elbow. You mean like now? Make another one right away? She sat up then too, Sarah's still a baby. If we wait she'll be older, and they'll be farther apart in age. If we did it right away they'd be closer, not just in age, but in everything. I rolled on my back and put my right hand behind my head. Well you may have a point. I'll be done with school by Christmas. I'm pretty sure something's already lined up. Your company's been pretty good about Sira and all. Let's check the money thing in a couple days. We should talk to our parents too. I mean our moms are the daycare. She snuggled up under my left arm. My mother's already said something. I checked our finances. Even if you didn't pick up something right away I'm doing really well at work. We could wing it, no sweat. I felt good. Another baby? Why not? Then, wait oh. Why now? Why now when Dave's suddenly back? No, Celine's not that devious. She wouldn't. I turned my head and kissed her soft cheek. Okay, when do we start? Celine jumped up. I'll take my diaphragm out now. Let me clean up. We can start tonight. The nascent erection I had collapsed. Oh well I thought. He'll come back. It did, and we did, and then we sent asleep. And then, it was like a nightmare. All my fears and anxieties came home. We'd gotten through Sunday. Celine was off Monday. I worked all day, and had a class Monday night. It was that time of year, late winter when anything could happen. The weather lady said there'd be some precipitation. It had been unseasonably cold, and the ground was still hard. I was about halfway to school. The rain was falling and turning to ice when it hit. That's when the man on the radio announced classes were cancelled. I came to a stop, got my bearings, put my vehicle into four-wheel. Like that would help? I turned around. I slowly drove back home. When I got back I parked and saw Dave's motorcycle was over on the grass near our garage apartment. Oh, I figured. He's back for some more sympathy. I went inside, took my wet shoes off at the bottom of the stairs and started up. I got about three quarters the way up the steps when I heard them. Oh no. I thought. This can't be happening. Celine and I meant so much to each other. All our plans, our hopes, the things we said. I continued up the steps and got to the kitchen. I started through the small living room toward our bedroom. Sarah had to be asleep. I heard everything. 
Dave was whispering to my wife, I'm so sorry I never wrote. I missed you so much. I heard Celine whisper back, I love you David. I've always loved you. God, he said, you're so warm. Your body's so soft. You're so sweet. I love your hair. Your lips are so full they're like blossoms. I can't get enough of you. Jesus, I thought, everything I loved about her, and she was sharing it with him. Then I heard her say, we can do it Dave. We can do it. My brother responded, he went for it? We can? You know I can never leave him, my wife answered. It would destroy my parents. But it's you Dave, it's always been you. We can do it then, he believed you. Oh Dave, I feel so guilty. Michael trusts me so, but I so want to have your baby. What the DNA? You being brothers, he'll never. I couldn't take it, not another word. I yelled, no. I pushed open the door. I had to stop this shameful thing. The next thing I heard was Celine, Michael, Michael, wake up. I rolled around. I almost tossed my dinner. I sat up. Oh, Celine was holding me. You must have been having a nightmare. Wait here, I'll get you some water. She looked over at the bassinet. Thank goodness, we didn't wake the baby. She slipped on her robe and scurried quietly into the kitchen. I was bathed in sweat. It was dream, only a dream. Thank God. Celine was back. Here, sweetie, drink some of this. I took a sip and handed her back the glass. She looked at the clock. It was late. She reached out and pulled me into her body, her soft, worn body. Come here, my darling. Let me fix it. She started to stroke my head. She kissed me just above my left ear. It's all right. I'm right here. I hugged her close. I didn't say anything for several seconds. Then I said, I love you, Celine. You know that. She kept stroking my head. I know you do. I love you too. You're my hero. Did you know that? I closed my eyes. I felt safe. It was only a dream, just a bad dream. Dream or not the next few days and weeks turned into a nightmare. David, poor pathetic, sickly David was at my parents, around my wife, and up my butt day and night. He was right when I looked on the internet. There was no record of his ever being in the Navy or any other branch of the service. On the other hand, over time and with some ingenuity and some money, I found out someone could uncover all manner of military matters. I mean, if I wanted to I could obtain the specifications to almost any type of military vehicle from the most primitive Humvee to detailed specifications about our best tanks and artillery. Oh, I realized some content was classified, but for the casual investigator say from some third world country interested in learning how to build the stuff, it was almost all there. Of course, knowing how and actually delivering a weapon were two different things. I guess the big thing was the rare metals that were needed, not to mention the availability of competent manufacturers. I wasn't into weapons anyway. I wanted to find out about my brother and I did. He'd never served in anything except a couple prisons. My brother had a criminal record. Nothing overwhelming, just a bunch of minor things, mostly involving controlled substances like cocaine and heroin. Like I originally suspected my brother was an addict. I didn't worry about his drug troubles. How he got that way wasn't my problem. What was my problem was how to break it to mom and dad, and more important how to let Celine know without her getting all defensive. Some people are actors. They see something and they take action. Others are worriers. They see a problem and they worry. They stress. They obsess. Damn it. That was me. The classic obsessive compulsive. Throw in being a coward and my dossier was complete. Celine's a good girl. Always has been a good girl. But she's also a bleeding heart. Any other time and place, she'd have been a Robert Kennedy liberal. The type that's always looking for some cause. Me, I'm more on the moderate conservative side. Sure, I see somebody hungry, I'll fix them a fish. But while I'm fixing it, I'll show them how to catch their own. After that, they're not my problem. So David was an addict. He needed help, but that didn't mean more money to feed his addiction. I needed to talk with my brother, but I had to keep mom, dad, and Celine from knowing. I finally got him cornered one afternoon at the local tavern. He was in the corner with some other guys. Like always, he was bullshitting. I got him on the side and said, Hey Dave, I need you for a minute. He gave his pals one of those, little brother can't make it without me grins, and agreed to walk to a corner booth. We both sat down, Dave I know. No what, was his reply. I answered, don't be so insouciant. I know about you. He said, what the hell is insouciant? I got a little pissed, partly because I thought he was a little smarter than that, but second because I knew he was and he deliberately messed with me on my choice of words, I replied. It means you got a great big I don't give a shit attitude about everything, and you're a total bullshitter who's never been anywhere or done anything except get high, get in trouble and go to jail. In fact, I'm surprised you haven't been harvested by the three strikes laws. He rocked back in his chair and laughed. 
Then he leaned forward. He got real close and said, Well, screw you, little brother. Been checking up, have you? Okay, well, screw you. Screw your wife, too. I said, What's that supposed to mean? Look stupid, he said. I got her long before you ever did. She was my little hooker back in high school. And you know what? I'm going to screw her again. Yeah, I'm going to screw her. Knock her chunky little bum up, and then I'm ditching this shithole. I knew he hadn't got her in high school. How did I know? Well, that was obvious. I got her that night at my parents. What I did think was she was still carrying a torch for the scum sucker, and with her gooey, oh he needs my help attitude to everything he just might get into her britches. If he did, I knew what I'd do. I'd kill this son of a bitch and yes, I'd have to leave her. I gave my brother my very best glower, which I dare say wasn't much, and I told him, I want you to leave. I promise if you leave, I won't rat you out to mom and dad. I won't ruin Celine's childish fantasies, but you've got to leave. He scowled. Or what? They wouldn't believe you. Mom and dad are convinced I got sick serving my country, and Celine? Shit you stupid pig. She still loves me. She married you because you were her second choice. All I have to do is snap my fingers. With that he snapped his fingers, and she's in my bed, legs spread wide, and my Johnny pumping deep inside her. I would have punched David in the nose right then and there, but that wouldn't have accomplished anything except get me in trouble. Plus, knowing the slimy worm across from me, who used to be my brother, he'd only use it to garner more sympathy. For all I knew, he'd probably get me arrested and then sue me. I didn't know what the hell to do. I sat back, David, you're still my brother. I remember us growing up, the good days. Don't ruin it. Don't screw up mom and dad's good memories. Celine sure doesn't need this shit. Do us all a favor and leave. Just leave. Make up some story and pull out. He got up. I'll leave after I've pumped your wife. And not until. Then he walked away and out the door. Damn this was getting hairy. Celine was working odd hours. And my mom and hers were babysitting Sarah when I wasn't working or in classes. Celine and I had agreed we'd get pregnant again. And around Thanksgiving Celine missed a month. So it looked like the stork would be making a visit sometime in the late spring. What scared me about the whole thing was. While I'd been working and attending classes I knew David had been lurking around in the shadows. I mean the son of a bitch was a determined so-and-so. Then Celine was looking pregnant. Was the baby mine? About that time, around and right after Thanksgiving mom and dad seemed to be acting funny. It was like they were trying to hide something from me. God, I thought, Celine had slept with my brother. My parents knew it and were trying to protect me. That worried me. Worse. David's behavior since he'd come back had always been on the overconfident side, but lately he'd been acting downright arrogant. That really worried me. Even worse, maybe I was oversensitive, but it seemed like Celine was behaving differently. It was as though there was this veil of secrecy, this thin curtain, like a shroud of subterfuge that covered many of the things she said and did. In fact, the only things that seemed good were our conversations about a new baby, our mutual love for Sira, and what we did in bed. The bed thing. There was something there I couldn't quite put my finger on either. Something that seemed different, scary. Celine and I had always been what I'd call sexual soulmates. We both liked the foreplay. We both enjoy traditional sex. By that I mean we both prefer the missionary position. There has always been something about the old vanilla missionary thing that Celine and I enjoyed. We talked about it once. Alabama, my favorite group, wrote a song about it. She and I. One of the lines went, she and I live in our own special world. That's what it was. We were in our own special world, our own little cocoon. No one else, nothing else, just us, only us. That's what I guess really scared the living shit out of me. We had this thing, this special thing about love and sex and intimacy and all that. I was so afraid my brother would destroy it. I hated him, and I hated myself for being so afraid to do anything about it. I just had to trust my wife. I did, but I was still scared, and the way she'd been behaving in bed only made things worse. Over the last several days, no I'd say few weeks she'd been more ardent, for demanding, more loving than ever. What was reason for it? I'd been stupid. I'd been reading up on things like cheating and infidelity. When women got more affectionate it could mean a lot of things. Two of those things were fear and guilt. Guilt. Oh Jesus, I feared. David and my wife were doing it. She'd succumbed to her old childish fantasies. She'd been benumbed by my brother's phony charms and greasy ways. My wife had let my brother into our lives. My dream, my nightmare was real. That explained mom and dad too. They knew. They knew and were afraid if I found out I'd leave her. My nightmare was like a monster about to engulf and destroy everything I cherished. There was only one thing to do. 
In my dream, I'd missed class and gone home early and caught my brother in bed with my wife. I'd have to play out the dream. My life had degenerated into an old Hitchcock movie. I had no choice. I had to find out. I started ditching classes. Oh, I was careful. I made sure the professors were cooperative. I explained about our baby. I told both of them I'd have to miss a class from time to time to babysit. They were supportive. By then my a-hole brother had gotten rid of the motorcycle and bought another car. He'd slipped away for a few days and came back with another beauty. It was another one of those things where he showed up with an almost brand car with out-of-state tags. This time the car was a Lexus and the tag was Pennsylvania. The first time he'd had a car with Indiana plates and I didn't know much about their policies. This time was different. I was more attuned to Pennsylvania law and I was pretty sure he might have stolen this one. I held my peace. I worried. What was wrong with the son of a bitch? I knew about cocaine. How it could alter a personality, a perfectly regular guy could become a deceitful a-hole. Had drugs done that to him? Was it my fault? Was it up to me to do something? Considering how I knew he was stalking my wife, I guess I should've. I'd already missed three classes with no luck catching my wife or that hateful shit of a brother. This was my fourth missed class. Suddenly there it was. I knew someday it had to happen, but I always believed that the someday would never be today. I knew I wasn't making any sense, but for anyone who's ever been in a predicament like this, they know it never makes sense. David had his Lexus parked right in my spot. I scanned the Campanarises and saw their car wasn't around. Not in the garage and not on the street. Sure, I remembered, it was Thursday and on some Thursdays they went to the Masonic Lodge. Yeah, my father-in-law was a Mason. He wanted me to join. My brother was upstairs in my apartment with my wife. My daughter was up there too. This was it. I had to know. I didn't know what I'd do if I found something bad, but I had to at least know. I got out of my car, my old rickety rusty S10. I quietly opened the unlocked door. I took off my shoes and stealthily climbed the stairs to what I feared more than anything else in the world. I was almost in tears. Was my wife in there betraying everything we hoped for and dreamed of? Oh, I couldn't even think it. I got to the top step and very quietly opened the door that led into our kitchen. Between our small kitchen and the bedroom was a tiny living room. I saw our bedroom door was open. Based on what I'd read this was where I'd start to hear the moans and groans. The O oh, put it in me. The O oh, you're so big. The O oh, I'm so glad it's you. Anyone who's ever been betrayed knows the litany. I crept through the kitchen. That's when I heard. They were in, of all places, the living room. I backed up and retreated to the stairs. I could still hear just more faintly. It was stunning. My world was forever changed. They had to have been sitting on the sofa. I'd gotten there at just the right time. I heard David first, you know I love you, and I know you love me too. I heard Celine, I do love you. I love you more than you know. My throat was dry. My lips had turned to powder. I had to keep listening. I heard him. Then why can't we make it mean something? All we have to do is go back there. I couldn't see but I assumed my brother meant our bedroom. I heard him say, we can, we need take that last step. Then I heard Celine. It almost broke my heart. David, I've loved you since I was a child. I worshipped you. You were all I dreamed of. Celine, I heard him whisper, it's not too late. We can still make it happen. Then Celine spoke. I gulped, David, things are different now. He interrupted, sure, there's Michael. We won't hurt him. He'll never know. He's a good guy, but I was here first. My heart skipped a beat. Did he mean he really did get her back in high school? Then I listened to Celine. You were first in my heart, David, but you know I was saving myself. That's why I couldn't let you. He said, I would have stayed, but... Then she murmured, if you had stayed, but you didn't. Oh, I came around to your parents. I waited. I hoped, but something happened. Don't tell me you fell for the kid, my brother said. Then Celine said the things I'd never thought she'd say. It was easy, David. Michael was so kind. He was so sweet. He was so good-hearted. I could see he liked me. I saw his liking me grow into something more. It happened to me too. David, how can I make you understand? Yes, I loved you. Yes, I missed you. But then, then it changed. I stopped going to your parents to watch for you. I was going there to see Michael. Talk about renewal. I could hear the desperation in my brother's voice. But I would have come back. I wanted to. Oh, David. I heard my wife. It wouldn't have mattered. Michael was. He is. He became my hero. Girls have their fantasies. I don't know what to say. I'll always love you, David, but it's not the same. You were like a myth, a lost dream, a vision lost in the mist. Michael was real. He was good to me. He cared. I could see it in his face. I heard it every time he spoke to me. 
I felt it in his hands, the way he held me, he loved me. Then one day I looked around and wondered, what did I ever see in you? You were the iron pyrite. Michael was, no Michael is the gold. He's my everything. He's the father of my child, my hero, my lover, my friend, my heart. David, don't you see? I idolize that kid as you call him. You want me to betray that? I could never do that. David, I love Michael. I heard his last gasp, but Celine. I heard her final pronouncement, I think you better leave. Oh, Alabama. There are angels among us. There are angels among us, and I married one. I silently closed the upstairs door. I slipped down the stairs, grabbed my shoes, sped to my car, and I got away before anyone saw me. I drove on to the college. Yeah, I was late, missed most of the class. So what? I made up some lame story about a late babysitter. Nobody questioned me. I stayed for the end of the class, and then I went home. Celine and I had been bickering about names for our next child. Celine was Italian, and we'd gone full bore Italian with Sira. Me, what with Sullivan being Irish, I kind of wanted to do the Irish thing. Celine and I were poles apart. On the way home, I stopped and got a clump of flowers at the Walmart. This would be my peace offering. I got home and trudged up the stairs. Celine had Sira in her arms. I held up the flowers. I thought about the new baby's name. If you want, she interrupted me. I've been thinking too. I kind of like Maureen. Like that Maureen O'Hara if it's a girl. If it's a boy, we could go with Connor. I plopped down in one of the kitchen chairs. Gee, Celine, you'd sold me on the Verna thing? No, she said. We're going Irish for number two. We can switch back to Italian for number three. I got up and poured myself some water. Well, sweetheart, if that's what you want. She bounced Sira around on her lap. Yes, that's what I want. And so that's how it was. So, Devin looked at me. I'm still a little confused. Why are you here in this coffee shop doing this? Whatever it is you're doing. Why aren't you home? I smiled. I just got through another interview. I'm still not sure where the job will be, but I'm getting my ducks in line. Celine's on her way over now. She's seven months along with number two. We're going to do some grocery shopping and she can't carry the bags. So, you two are good then? I smiled. Very good. Devin grinned. I'm glad. And I guess you were okay with the Tommy thing then. Him getting her cherry? I sat back. Glad you asked Devin. You know back when we started our rerun, our second try, Tommy showed up. He told me what happened that night. You mean the night out there on Bear Creek? Yeah. He explained it to me. Seems he and some of his pals had juiced her up with ecstasy. He got her in his car and took her for the ride. But when he started to try to do the dirty, you know the old in and out. She got lucid. He told me he already had his dong out when she started crying and yelling. She kicked him right in the work kit. Then she jumped from the car. Tore her blouse and slacks on the way out. He said she kept crying she was saving herself for someone. He never heard her say who though. Tommy said he was so fired up he shot off right while she was on the way out. I think that explained the spunk. Devin their stories weren't exactly the same. But I would have been suspicious if they were. Did she talk him into telling me? I'll never know. Don't care really. What good would it serve? Was she a virgin on our wedding night? Well, no. I told you already. We'd gotten that taken care of beforehand. Was I her first? I think so. Does it matter? I mean, really matter? I know David never got her. Tommy probably didn't. There weren't too many others out there. I know one thing. I'm happy. She's all I'll ever want or need. You know what scares me? What if she'd become a nun? Then I would have been shit out of luck? Devin nodded. So tell me, did you ever tell her you overheard the conversation she had with your brother? No, why would I? If I did, I would have had to explain how I'd been ditching classes to catch her with David. She'd have known I doubted her. You know Devon trust is a fragile thing. It's a rare treasure. Once it's broken or tarnished, it can never be fully restored. I mean, if she thought I had doubts about her, she might think there were reasons for her to doubt me. Damn it, Devon, there are a half dozen women who'd been with me. She knows some of them. I'm in classes with some damn beautiful coets. What if I got a job and my boss was some sexy babe? I guess what I'm saying is, I love my wife. Her confession to David made me feel good, but the way I heard it would have only hurt her. Celine's given me one beautiful girl, and we're making another. It's her body, not mine, that's changing. She's self-conscious and afraid as it is. She doesn't need any crap like that from me. I love her. She's my girl, my sweetheart. No, something like would only hurt. And one more thing too, Devin. What's that, Mike? I've learned to trust. Sure, she's not perfect. Who is? I trust her. I was stupid not to. You see we can't go around worrying about shit that probably never happened. You see what I mean? My doubts, 
my mistrust have all been products of my insecurities, and for me that's just childish nonsense. Damn it, she trusts me too. With that I saw my cell phone buzzing on the table, that's her Devin. I'll be seeing you. As I got up to leave Devin asked, hey, whatever happened to your brother? I turned, oh David. He split a couple days after his visit with Celine. No one knows where he went, and I didn't care either. All I know is I've got all I ever wanted. And they're all right out there in the car. I waved, see you around. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.